I left my husband for something better, and now he's living his best life while I'm stuck. Walking into the living room with the cake blazing, my daughters and I burst into a chorus of happy birthday while I carefully tiptoe towards the delighted birthday boy. My girls, aged 14, 12, and 10, rush to their dad, enveloping him in a group hug. They catch his eye, and we smile at one another as he leans forward to blow out the 50 candle. An hour later, after the presents have been opened, I quietly take my leave. No one notices me go or even acknowledges my feeble goodbye. You see, this isn't my home anymore. The girls are staying with their father this evening to continue the celebrations. It's his house, not mine. As I drive home that evening, I pull over, bursting into tears, chastising myself over and over again for ending my marriage five years ago when I was 44. I bitterly regretting my hasty decision, not just because it was impulsive, but because I still love my ex-husband. Lawrence was not unfaithful. He didn't treat me cruelly. He is a fantastic father and had no strange issues. My impetus for pressing the self-destruct button on my 15-year marriage was far more mundane than that. I was dissatisfied, insecure, and worn down by what I perceived as the drudgery of my life, and I lost my temper with him one too many times. Truthfully, it's not like I haven't built a life for myself since our split. I've been seeing my partner, Tom, for two years now, and he idolizes me. Yet, while I do love him, whenever I compare him to Lawrence, I'm afraid Tom pales in comparison. If Lawrence asked me to try again, I'd dump Tom without a backward glance. Five years ago, with three daughters under ten and chronically ill parents, life was unrelenting. There were times in my early forties when I wondered what on earth I'd done to deserve such a life. As a stay-at-home mom, my days were a never-ending loop of school runs, chores, and caring for my parents. Occasionally, I'd get to go to the gym or meet a friend for coffee. Meanwhile, Lawrence went to work and saw his friends afterward if it suited him. He only helped with chores and playdates on the weekends. One thing that really bothered me, he created a man cave at home just for himself. The 10 by 13 space filled with his books, computer games, and boys toys came to represent everything I resented about the unfairness in our relationship. Why did he get to have a sanctuary away from the responsibilities of parenthood and running our home when I was the one shouldering the vast majority of the burden? Over the years, what began as an inside joke between my girlfriends built into constant simmering resentment, further fueled by their own stories of husbands not doing their fair share. Yeah, I never addressed it with him, something I now bitterly regret. Should I have also sought professional psychological support through this tough period? All I remember was feeling constantly tired, stressed, guilty, and resentful. I was short with the girls and even shorter with Lawrence. One cold Sunday morning in January, he left his mug near the dishwasher instead of putting it in the machine. I let rip, it all to come out. What a selfish father he was, spending hours in his man cave, never lifting a finger in the kitchen. How underwhelming he was in bed. Actually, he wasn't. If anything, I was the underperformer, constantly finding excuses not to get intimate. And when we did, I was actually willing it to be over so that I could get some sleep. I saw him going, yet seething red. I carried on shouting, we weren't even husband and wife. We were just partners bringing our children up. I then uttered the words, I really wish I hadn't. We should just call it quits. I want someone better than you. But that's when I finished spewing out my awful tid. I crumpled on the floor where I burst out into tears. I assume, just like the other occasions when I had a monumental meltdown, Lawrence would kneel down and give me a soothing hug, not this time. He walked out of the room. That night, he went to stay at his mom's house, and after calling him throughout the night with no reply, the following day an email arrived telling me that I was right. We should call it quits. Apparently life was too short to walk on eggshells around me. He could never predict when I would erupt, scorching everything around me, and then expecting it all to be forgiven in a heartbeat. Although Lawrence considered me a great mother, his rating of me as a wife was pretty poor, and he'd had enough. That was a low blow. We started out with such high hopes. Lawrence and I got together when we both worked at the same bank, and we were joined at the hip from the start. After dating for a year, I fell pregnant, and he proposed. When our first daughter arrived, I took extended maternity leave and never went back to the bank. I adored being a mother and always operated from the position that mom knows best. I became a bit of a perfectionist and tyrant. Lawrence tried to help, but if things weren't done my way, they were wrong. Today, I recognize I sound like an utter nut. But when you're sleep deprived and forever catching up on chores, you don't have the time or patience to see it. I didn't appreciate what we had. Lawrence was a programmer, hence the man cave, and he earned a decent five-figure salary. Living in the Midlands meant we could afford a family summer holiday every year. We'd have film nights at home and the occasional date night. I never doubted that he loved me. 
The it's over email was, I thought, a knee-jerk reaction, so I left him to cool off for a few days. I told the girls daddy needed to spend some time with his mom because she was unwell. But after a week, it became pretty clear he wasn't coming back. Fast forward 9 months, and I was officially divorced. During the negotiations, egged on by my girlfriends who were navigating similar relationship issues, I reluctantly assumed it was the right decision. Even my solicitor steered me firmly back on the divorce track whenever I had doubts. I got everything I asked for, custody of the kids, the house, and maintenance. Lawrence found a smaller property with enough room for the girls. Yet, plagued by doubts, I tried to call it off more than once. On rare occasions during child handovers, I pleaded for another chance and suggested seeing a relationship counselor. But whenever I asked, Lawrence would stonewall me. In a last desperate attempt, just before the divorce was finalized, I arranged for a babysitter and turned up unannounced, begging him to talk things through. He coldly asked me to leave. Even a month after the divorce went through, I wasn't put off and gave it another go. This time, he did let me in. Now that we were officially divorced, I pleaded, could we at least be friends? I saw Lawrence that night, the one I fell in love with, funny, charming, and one glass of wine led to another. We ended up in bed together. Before I left while he was still asleep, I scribbled a heartfelt note telling him how much I loved him and how I hoped this could be the start of a new us. The following day, I received a curt text informing me that it had been a mistake. The following two years post-divorce went by in a blur of handovers every other weekend and Wednesday nights. I hated doing the walk of shame when I'd leave the girls with him, convinced the neighbors were watching and judging me as the woman who had the perfect family and threw it away. In my social circle, opinions fell into two camps. My family thought I had taken leave of my senses, while my friends told me I'd done the right thing. I understand now that their advice was prejudiced by their own marital issues, and I wish I hadn't been so influenced by their bitter perspectives. On days when the girls weren't with me, I threw myself into internet dating. There were more misses than hits, and this only made me further realize what a fool I'd been in losing Lawrence. I compared every new man I met to him, and they always came up wanting. My oldest, who is now 14, is very much aware of how much I regret what happened. Though she was initially keen for us to get back together, she has pretty much adapted to our circumstances now. She reports back to me about the odd dates Lawrence goes on. Listening to her describe each woman feels like a dagger to my heart, yet I can't help asking her which neighbors are interested in her dad and which women he's seen more than once. One Christmas, after receiving a rather thoughtful present from her father, I asked my daughter if she thought we could ever get back together, and the answer was a big fat no. She went on to outline what he thinks about everything, from my newly yoga tone figure to the change in my life path. I've retained a life coach, and apparently, he prefers my curves and laughs at my new professional direction. I met Tom on a dating app two years ago after a few stop-start relationships with other guys. By then, I reluctantly acknowledged that the odds of Lawrence and me reuniting were slim to none, and I needed to move forward, at least as far as everyone else was concerned. Tom ticks every box, he makes me laugh, is a good cook, is perfectly adequate in bed, and is great with my kids. But he just isn't Lawrence. So here I am, in my late 40s, a divorcee who can't help but look back. I still make a big deal out of birthdays, Father's Day, and Christmas because it's on those days when we all come together that I can fool myself into thinking we're a family again. And I know I will love Lawrence until the day I die. Story 2. I, 36 female am married, 37 male for over a decade. Some months ago, I got diagnosed with GAD, Generalized Anxiety Disorder and Depression, post-pandemic issues. I have a therapist every week, take medication, and I see my psychiatrist once a month. But I feel like my problems with my husband is more than I can take right now. Whenever I have a meltdown, my husband doesn't want to cuddle or spend time with me. He says I have to deal with it all by myself, talk to a friend or my therapist. He says he cannot give me what I need, cuddling and support. So, when I isolate myself due to anxiety, we end up in an argument. He accuses me of ignoring our children and being rude, I get very irritated, but not violent to him. If I decide to hang out with friends, socialization is what I truly need. He gets jealous and accuses me of looking for another man. In any of those situations he keeps arguing with me until I reach my breaking point. I end up in an anxiety attack and need to take a sedative. When I tell him I cannot live like that, he says we need to get a divorce because he is my trigger. I tried to explain that I have many triggers right now due to my mental illness. I don't blame him. My problem is how he handles it. That whenever I have a problem, he runs away or transforms it into a problem about himself. He constantly says that he's not an empathetic person and doesn't know how to handle that. 
However, when I come to my breaking point, he says he loves me, take care of me and hug me until I fall asleep. The next day he says he want to be with me forever. I told him I feel abandoned by him and unloved. I truly feel that he wants a divorce, but he is waiting for me to make the decision. I feel quite blind in this situation. I truly don't know what to do. I have little energy, and I wish I could focus it on getting better, especially for my kids. I can't use it to help my relationship right now, but I don't know what I should do to make him understand that. I really don't know how I can solve this problem without messing with my treatment. Any advice will be very welcomed. Thanks for reading it. Edit. So, as I posted before, I've going through a lot at home. I've anxiety and my husband doesn't know how to cope with it. Now, I believe he simply doesn't want to cope. We visited my doctor together so he could understand a little bit about the situation. Generalized anxiety disorder and depression. Terrible idea. He criticized me all the time. Blamed me for not getting better and at the end said he didn't believe we could work out anymore. Yes, he said that to my doctor who was trying to make him understand how GAD and depression are affecting me. At the end, I was crying and he was angry at me and at the doctor. He insisted I took him to a couple's therapy without his consent. The next day I asked him the question I posted. When he couldn't answer if he still loved me, I removed my wedding ring and said we were done. I couldn't be with someone who couldn't answer this simple question. More than a decade together and that's how he answered me. He apologized, cried and said he doesn't love me anymore. My anxiety has destroyed his feelings for me. I'm heartbroken, but relieved, because I couldn't spend my energy on this relationship, when clearly I was the only one fighting for it. At least now, I know it's over. However I feel lonely, since I will have to fight this mental disorder all by myself. Family lives far away. I must get better for my children and I. I cannot move out right now, nor him. We will have two different bedrooms while sharing the house. We will also talk to a mediator in order to organize the separation while I'm fighting against GAD and depression. I hope it's gonna help. We have the kids and they don't know yet how to tell them. I feel like I failed this family and I'm afraid I will end up getting worse. Tell me how did you cope with all of this if you went through similar situation in your past. I need some hope. Thanks for reading. Update. Hello you all. First of all, thanks for the kind messages and PM I received. I cannot thank you guys enough. I just want to make an update and also vent a little bit. So, after the decision to get separated, things got better at home. I believe that a weight has been removed from our shoulders, so we had almost no arguments. We were being kind to one another and my anxiety got better as well as my depression. Things were so good that we made the mistake of sleeping together. That gave me lots of hope. Maybe, we would find our way back together. After that, we talked. I told him we could not repeat that. I still have feelings for him, so it would hurt me a lot if the sex meant nothing to him. We had a mediation session and tears were all over. We agreed he would no longer hug me when I left in the morning. The mediator said we had to cut those physical connections to avoid repeating the same mistake. Also, he would clear his office which would become my new bedroom. It was difficult, but we cut off the hugs after a couple days. He, on the other hand, asked for the day off at work. I thought it would be to clean the office, but no. Later he told me he has an internal fight. He didn't want the separation, but he believed that it was necessary, because we were not happy together. I remind him he is the one who doesn't love me anymore, and that I am unhappy due to my depression. A couple days later we were discussing something and messages kept popping up on my phone. It was a Reddit male friend, call X, who has the same name as a friend, call Z, I have over here. This same day, I would go to a party where Z would be attending. My ex got a bit uncomfortable and asked me if Z and I were flirting. I said no, and explained that the messages were from X, who lives in another country. He was clearly jealous and when I returned from the party, my ex tried to have sex with me, which I denied. The next day, we talked about that and I asked him about his feelings. I ensured him I was not interested in other people. Also, that, once again, we could not make love if he didn't love me anymore. I asked him if he was unsure about his feelings, but he said he was just corny, nothing else. I felt so disrespected. He knew about my feelings and tried having sex with me because he was corny. The next days I kept sending him photos of the new furniture I would need to buy for my new room. I was asking him some advices regarding the size of them. None of them was good, too big, too small, too expensive. After that, I reminded him that he needed to clean the office. I told him that sharing a room was making things difficult for me. So, I asked him if he was having second thoughts, because he was delaying it. Plus, 
He was issues with every suggestion I made regarding the furniture. He didn't even think twice before answering. Nah, I am being just lazy. You are complicating things. He suggested I could clean it myself. I reminded him that this was his job, and that we had agreed on that during the mediation. Yeah, this super sincere answer hurt. But now we are back to arguments. Again, he does not accept my emotions and get angry or rude to me. Anytime I say something he doesn't like. Sometimes I feel like he deliberate confuses me, so I don't move on. Update, just a quick update. We had a mediation session earlier this week. I spoke about the mixed signals he sent me. How they confused me and gave me hope. The mediator said exactly what you guys said. There is not coming back now. You made your decision clear, Ben, my ex. Can you see how you make her feel? It is not helpful. He cried and apologized to me. After the session I had a very depressive episode where I couldn't stop crying. He put me in bed, gave me my medicine and stayed with me until I fell asleep. This same night he started cleaning the office. Yesterday he went to the store to get my new mattress, so I didn't have to wait for delivery nor do it by myself. He also measured the things I needed and helped me with everything related to the new furniture. I think reality wasn't hitting him so deep down as it was supposed to be. Our next step will be the worst one, to tell the kids what's going on. I already prepared notes to send to their teachers and got a therapist in case they need someone to talk to. Once again, thanks for the kind messages and suggestions. I feel much better now. Update, hello again. My ex said something a time ago regarding a lost friendship and I would like to use this metaphor over here. This separation feels like grieving without a body to grieve on. I have to go through all the mourning phases as if I have lost something. I did lose my emotional support, my confidant and who I used to lean on. I am learning how to walk alone again, and it hurts a lot. However, I am fine. It does not hurt as much as before and I feel less lost. I denied. I got angry, then tried to bargain. I got more depressed and hurt, but finally I arrived at acceptance. Each stage had its own time. I needed help to get over each one of them. I am not ready to date anyone, but I am having a blast getting to know new people. My ex, on the other hand, is having a hard time. He cried a lot last week, got angry, tried to annul the separation and get back together. He asked me to change my passwords, so he would not give in to the desperation to check my phone. I tried to help him, because I am like that. I love him, he is part of my life and my kid's dad. I cannot leave him suffering, so I offered him some help, some support. But also, I respected my limits, my boundaries and I didn't betray my process. I didn't let him kiss me, but I gave him a hug when he needed. I was able to separate each feeling, because I was being his friend, not his wife anymore. And I was able to do that without jeopardizing my progress of acceptance. Now I sleep better, I can concentrate on my job, tell friends about my separation and feel that my anxiety and depression are getting better. I am helping him as much as I can, but I accept that the separation is necessary at the moment. I accept that we might get back together in the future or not. I am not anxious about it right now. I am accepting the present and the past and hoping for a better future. And for the first time, in months, I told my therapist that in a couple months I might be able to reduce the dose of my medication. There is hope. There is a light at the end. We just need to accept that everything takes its own time. Update, hello, it's been a while, but so much has happened that I don't even know what to think about it. So, I decided to come here and tell you all about it. Please, you can judge me if you feel like it. So, I went to a birthday party with some friends and I met someone, let's call him Nate. He is very nice, has a beautiful smile, and is also divorced. His ex told him she didn't love him anymore and asked for the divorce. But there is a problem, he used to be my ex's co-worker. So, during the party, he and I talked a lot, due to so much in common. My friend reminded me we were both single and we were definitely enjoying each other's company. The party was amazing and I was drinking a lot, so I decided I would stay for the night in my friend's house. I was sitting on the floor when Nate came to sit close to me with a gorgeous smile. I felt like a thousand butterflies were in my stomach. We were laughing, talking and he was sitting very very close to me. Suddenly he tried to kiss me, but I said no. I totally freaked out. I invited him outside so we could talk away from people. I said I thought that being with him would be a bad idea due to my ex, Ben knowing him. When his ex asked for the divorce, he was very sad and told my ex about it. They were not friends, but they could have been. Nate told me he was really into me, complimented my beauty and my smile, and held my hand. We were both drinking a lot, so I just gave in and kissed him back, and it was amazing. I was not checking my phone and Ben was trying to reach me out to check if I was really okay. 
I usually don't drink to the point I cannot drive or take an Uber. So, Ben contacted my friend to ask if I was okay. So, my friend texted me to let me know what was going on, since she knew I was with Nate. She told Ben I was with her, sleeping. When I came home in the morning he started asking me questions, where I was, who I was with. I told him I didn't have to answer him, it was my privacy. So, I found out he checked all my social media accounts and messages, read all my private messages with my friend and wrote nasty things to her due to her lie. He also reached Nate and said nasty things to him too. He said they were friends and that Nate had betrayed him. Furthermore, he used a fake account, as sexy girl to message a guy he thought I was with. Then said I acted like a 20 years old girl who had no responsibilities nor kids, because I came back in the morning. I felt terrible after that. I knew my kids were safe with him, but maybe he is right. He said I need to grow up and not go out drinking again like a young girl. It is not the first time he has told me that. Ben cried all day long, asked me to come back to him, to try again, and that he didn't want to lose me. I told him I didn't believe in his love at all, but he swore he truly loved me, that he was mistaken. I met Nate a couple days later to apologize for Ben's reactions. Nate told me things I didn't remember at all, alcohol. According to him I called myself too old to make out with someone, not attractive due to some white hairs and a mother's body, and that I didn't deserve his compliments. Nate was gentle and kind to me and said how much he wanted to spend time with me again. He made me feel beautiful and attractive again, and not too old. Nate will be away for two months now. He texted me a couple times and we saw each other again before his departure. He said he understands this is all new to me and too soon, but that he would like to take me on a date when he comes back. I, on the other hand, feel like being with him is wrong, very wrong, and sleeping with or going on a date is even worse. Update, first of all, thank you all for the kind messages, tips and concerns. It is amazing how strangers can mean so much. I will try to summarize as much as I can, since a lot has happened. Myself, I am much better now, and I am able to see things I couldn't before. I feel much better now, psychologically speaking and next week I will visit my doctor. I still have some bad days, depression, but in general, I believe I am almost over it. Ben causes me lots of anxiety and we had some harsh talks about that. No, I hadn't moved out yet. Unfortunately I currently live in a place where rents are increasing way too much. I cannot afford a place where I could live with my kids. But since we have a counselor, we are setting some strong boundaries. Then, last month he decided to self-medicate himself for depression. Crazy, I know. He got an old prescription that was still valid and decided to go back to the medication without talking to the doctor. Now he says he understands my anxiety and depression and begged me for a second chance. I said no. I have realized how much he tried to manipulate me in the past and lots of gaslighting signs. He said bad things about Nate, tried to access my phone, changed my passwords twice this month and made me feel suffocated, extremely haunted. He even used a fake profile to flirt with some guy's friends of mine he was jealous with. I could not believe in it. I made myself clear about my limits and boundaries. This is not the man I fell in love with. Nate, we have been talking every other day. We might see each other this Friday, a day after he is back. He is always very sweet and understanding. So he told me this I want to see you, no matter what we're doing together. So, no pressure regarding sex, lol. He knows I am not ready for a serious relationship right now, neither is he. We agreed on that we are living the present and whatever comes with it, we will handle it. I told him about my diagnostic and how things are complicated for me right now. Now, something really really creepy, what are the chances Ben and Nate share the same birthday? My friend, who believes in astrology, said this is a bad sign, I don't believe in those things. New update. Hello everyone. I have wanted to provide an update for a while. But I have gone through some difficult weeks. TLDR at the end. I had a date with Nate and things went amazingly well. After putting my kids to bed, I went out and had a great time with him. We have a very nice connection and spent the night together. Nate was very sweet. At first, Ben was very upset and cried a lot when I told him I was going out with Nate. He truly hates Nate and believes he is a bad influence on our kids. He still implies that Nate is a homewrecker and a horrible person. After a few days, he got better once he found someone to go out with. I found out who she was because she decided to stalk me on social media. Now, Ben goes out with her and he is back to his normal self, a happy single man who can be rude to his ex-wife. When he was alone, he begged me to give him another chance and cried during our meetings while professing his love. Once he found someone, he went back to being rude and reaffirmed to the conciliator that we are better separated. So, clearly, his problem was being alone. 
I also had a hard time with my depression this last month and had to return to my previous substance dosage. One of the reasons why I am unable to move out is that I am a part-time worker and a part-time student. During the pandemic, I became a HSM and had to take care of my baby at home while my kids had online classes and Ben struggled with depression. Once things got back to normal, I decided to pursue my dream of getting a master's degree. Now, with the divorce, I am in a bad spot. To make things worse, my work hours were cut in half a couple of weeks ago, and I got into a car accident the same week and lost my car. These were just some of the bad things that happened last month, and my mental health was wrecked. I feel stuck right now, with less money, a student loan to pay back, and an unfinished degree. At least during those bad moments, I could see who would be there for me. Ben was extremely rude to me when I called him for help after my car accident. I had one of my kids with me, and I was totally lost and nervous. The airbag came out, and I needed a ride home. From the phone call to the moment we went home, he didn't say one nice word to me. On the day I was informed I had lost some work hours, he made me cry in front of the kids. Nate, on the other hand, took me for a walk, so I could cry and swear as much as I needed to. He told me a million times that I can call him anytime, especially if I am having an anxiety attack. He made it clear he wants to be there for me and even offered me his place if I need to take some days off to recharge. I truly didn't want to find a person right now. I am not one of those people who cannot be alone. I wanted to get better and focus on my mental health, but for some reason, Nate came into my life. He became one of the happy moments I have in my days with his good morning messages. His hugs became a place where I feel safe and happy, and seeing him makes me feel good. It is clear that I cannot start dating him while living with Ben. It feels wrong, and Nate agrees with me. But he told me he is not going to see anyone else besides me and that he is in love with me. He even told his mother about me. Right now, we simply try to see each other once a week so we can enjoy the time together. TLDR, I had some financial issues during this last month and my mental health was wrecked. Ben is seeing someone and went back to his idiot mode. Nate and I are seeing each other and he told me he is in love. Update, hi everyone, I'm looking for some advice and feedback on my current situation with my ex-husband. We've been having ongoing issues with co-parenting and I'm wondering if his behavior constitutes parental alienation and what steps I can take. Here's what's been happening. Incident 1. Last week, my ex-husband was extremely rude to me in front of our kids and his mother. He was supposed to return some library books to the school that were at his place. He has ADHD. When I asked if he had returned them, he said, I didn't and I won't. I won't do what you demanded me, which I didn't do. If you want them returned, you should return them yourself. His mother spoke to me two days later, explaining that she talked to him about his attitude towards me, especially in front of our kids. She mentioned that he was repeating the same behavior his dad exhibited towards her and that the kids would soon realize how badly he treated their mother. Incident 2 Yesterday, we were all together for a farewell dinner for his mother. My youngest ran away from us in the middle of the parking lot. We all spoke at the same time to get her to stop. I was the loudest, yelling, the cars. She stopped, and my ex decided to scold me for yelling at our child. He said, control yourself in front of our kids and his mother again. I stared at him and said, don't scold me in front of the kids. He replied, go scold our child. I'm not in the wrong here. Private discussion. Today, when we were alone and away from the kids, I requested him, once again, to please not scold or disrespect me in front of the kids. I explained that if he disagrees with my actions, he should talk to me about it later. I emphasized that his behavior shows the kids that it's okay to talk to their mother that way. He said I was wrong and that I should control myself. He insisted that if the kids were in any danger, I should control my emotions, or he would scold me in front of them again. I explained that dismissing me in front of the kids could be seen as parental alienation. He responded by saying I was wrong and delusional. He refused any advice or guidance from professionals, stating that no matter what psychologists or therapists might say, he has his own opinion and won't change it. He told me he will no longer have this conversation and to sue him if I didn't agree with his behavior. Refusal of mediation and therapy. He has stated that he will not engage in any family therapy or mediation. Despite the existence of a center that helps divorcing couples with co-parenting, he refuses to talk to them. He says that we are not a couple and that his co-parenting is great. He also refuses to speak with a personal therapist, as he doesn't believe he needs it. According to him, any issues we have are because I try to control him. He insists that scolding me in front of them is necessary when I yell at our child, when she runs away from me, claiming he is protecting her. Given these incidents, I'm looking for advice on the following. 
Parental alienation. Does his behavior constitute parental alienation? Legal steps. What legal steps can I take to address his disrespect and refusal to co-parent cooperatively? I'm in Quebec, Canada. Mediation. Is there a way to enforce mediation or counseling through the court system? Any advice or shared experiences would be greatly appreciated. Thanks in advance for your help. Thank you so much for watching until the end. If you really like our videos, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Have a great day.